This is Bernita Reed. This is Bernita Reed. That's me. Yes. And we're here in the Hope House in San Antonio. Yes. It is October the 26th, 2019. Yes. And I'm here with Mr. John Herbert. Hmm. Uh, Hubert. Yeah. I would like to start with him introducing himself. Okay. My name is Johnny Hubert. I was born in Brenham, Texas, August the 15th, 1920. Who were your parents? My parents was Tom and Mary Hubert. And what was your mother's maiden name? My mother's maiden name was Mary Elazar. Uh, Take your time. Well, let's just say uh, 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 Chapel. Mary Elazar Chapel? Yes. Where were they born and when were they born? Uh, my mother was born in Granbury, Texas. I don't know the year. I think it was back in the 1800s. My father was born in Brenham, Texas in the 1800s. How far back can you go with your heritage? Uh, back in the 1800s, my grandfather, my great, my grandfather was Tom great, Harvey Hewitt. At, well, that's just a little bit closer because okay. of the noise okay. out there. My grandfather was Harvey Hubert, and uh, he was born sometime in, 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 in the 80s. And how about your grandmother? Do you, can you go back any further? Uh, back? He had a wife, but I don't think that was his first wife, but oh. her name was Nora. Nora. And uh, do you have any stories in your family from slavery times? No, ma'am. No. If I could answer your question, my memories go back as about 1923. I can remember when I was asking my daddy to let my mother sit down so I could raise her. Hold on just a second, I'll let this go past. Yeah. Okay, you said you remember you were asking your daddy what? To, to let my mother, she was trying to wean me and I would get my daddy to ask her to let me nurse her. I can go back that far. That's a really good memory. Yeah. Um, are there any stories back to those days that stand out? Any family story, any special memory? Uh, not to me, simply because I was born at a certain time in a certain era when uh, segregation was normal. So it was really nothing surprising to me that I could not drink out of the same fountain with the white people. And I could not go to the same uh, latrines with the white people. And I had to get off the sidewalk when I saw the trading people coming. All this was the norm. I did, it didn't bother me none at all. And yet in the black community, black community, we had so much fun till it never did bother me. What were some of the, um, were their names called at you when you were little? Did people call you names? Boy, being a youngster, they didn't pay too much attention to me because I was a youngster. And I mostly survived on my daddy's reputation. My daddy was a, a well-educated man. He finished the what they call the blue back sparrow. He didn't, he didn't know how much education he had, but he could uh, converse with anybody 
politics, religion, and 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 so I didn't have a whole lot of trouble. But all of this was normal to me. You said he finished the blue blue back speller. The blue back speller. Yes, his 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 teacher was Mr. Browning. Mr. Browning. Browning, and he never did know. There was no such thing as how far did he go in school. But I do know that he was a, a, a avid reader, and he was a very good speaker. He was a deacon in the church. He could preach a, a layman's sermon. They were a well-educated man. What was the name of the school that he attended? I don't know. I met his teacher, but he's just, I think it was just a school for black kids. And how about the church that he was the deacon at? What was the name uh, of that? that? That church has been rebuilt, but it's still there. It's uh, uh, in Brenham, Texas. Uh, new, new something. New Hope, new Hope, I believe it was. Baptist Church. Reverend Harris was the preacher, was the uh, and and he was my uncle. Is that where your parents are buried? My parents are buried in Burnham, Texas, and my, my my parents and my sister and her husband. What was your sister's name and her husband's name? Annie Mae Henderson and uh, L. C. Henderson. And are they buried at New Hope Baptist Church? No, they are buried in the Black Cemetery. I don't know the name of it in Burnham, Texas. It's near Blinn College. Where was your family home in Brenham, Texas? What street was that on? 1204 Jefferson Street, Brenham, Texas. And... Um, is there anything that stands out as far as how the family gathered together in Brenham? Do you have a special memory? Uh, I think the Divas, my mother's people, had a family reunion every year down somewhere out of Brenham. Uh, in the area of what, near Chapel Hill or something like that, maybe. Yeah, maybe, maybe I can remember. That's about all I can say. They, in fact, they have a, a, a really a family reunion down there every year. Now, I used to go down there until I got too old to drive. And did your family do something special for holidays? Did you gather? Uh, we may have, like Turkey, we would have Christmas for Turkey. New Year's Day, we always had, uh, it had to be black eyed peas and, and hog head. Yeah, that's that. Did you 19th of June, we really didn't have anything to eat, but we had a big celebration at the Black Park. And you celebrated emancipation? Yo, oh, not my, the year I was born, they celebrated my emancipation uh, three days. Three days, 19, 20, and 21st, I think they remember that. Now, I can't remember, but that's the history. Why was it the year you were born that they celebrated three I was days? just, it was going on all the time. I was just born in 1920. It was going, this used to be a big thing in Brenham. We would start celebrating before the 19th of June. People were coming in uh, from Houston and everywhere on the train, even at the station. We stayed up all night meeting trains of people coming to Brenham to celebrate the 19th of June. Now in Brenham, we had what we call the Henderson uh, Park where the baseball plays and the dances and the uh, uh, they had carnivals to come in and 
just all kinds of entertainment. It was a big thing. It was a very big thing, and it lasted three days. What do you know why in Brenham that it was so celebrated? Is there something connected to emancipation? Well, I don't think Brenham was the only city, but I think Brenham just did it in a grand way. And we might have been the best that I know of or ever heard of of celebrating the 19th. It was just even with even the the Caucasian people, they'd get out of the way and let her, and then they would come to and watch us dance. The new dances that we were doing, the swinging out, the tap dancing, the music that was being played, and all this kind of stuff. And they had be called a pavilion and and it was built in a circle like where you could dance all the way around it and then everything come back where you started. But on the sides, they had uh, 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 steps to go up into a small hallway and sit down and the white people would watch us dance. And we did dance. They were doing dances in the swing out, the tap dance and everything, and they were still doing the Virginia reels and everything, and they came to see us dance. And we had good music. Uh, 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 oh uh, uh, just on top, yeah. We had good music. We had out-of-town bands that were caught, and they were playing the blues and, and different. It, it, we had parades, queens and kings, and of the parade and it, of the 19th of June. That was a big thing. Who was he elected that year to uh, be the queen and the queen, and then they had the young queen and the young king. We, um, I'm gonna uh, just pull this up a little bit in your hand so that it doesn't okay. rub on the mic. Uh, there you go. We had, uh, we had a town crowder. This was a guy that were well, all over town advertising uh, the features of the 19th of June in the day. And I think this is, he, <laughs> I think this is the only thing he did. He was a town, you know, like Paul Revere was going, to, that's what he did. That's it. I've never heard of that type of celebration of the that is really wonderful. Oh, look, we, in Brenham, they did it bigger than anybody that I know of. Even when I came to San Antonio, it was no competition between, they barely mentioned 19th June here in, in Gilbert Brenham, that was a big thing. Did you have something special that you did? Did you dance? Did you tap dance? I was a little boy. I was a little boy, my, my sister and my brothers, older brothers, uh, went to, the, oh, Dad, we had Dad, oh, okay. This is what I'm saying about segregation. In the black community, we had a great time. It was always fun, always places to go, within walking distance, you know. You could walk all over Brenham and, and, and within a mile, you could go anywhere in Brenham, you know. Did no. they play a lot of sports? Did you play sports? Uh, I played sports. In Brenham, we had, uh, well, you had black leagues back in those days. You had Austin, Brenham, San Antonio, Giddens, uh, Chapel Hill, uh, I don't know. and. They would visit each other just like they do now, you know. Yes, we had, in Brenham, I think we had one of the best baseball teams. Uh, we had a young man that built us a professional baseball diamond and everything. We had a vision like they have now, just not as big, but you could go and sit in there and watch the game. And uh, we had, uh, I think our baseball, pictures and everything, they would hire somebody to come in and join the team. Uh, here in San Antonio, on the west side, you have the Frank Garrett uh, uh, Park over there. 
Frank Harris' people lived in Brenham. And one of his brothers was a star player on the uh, 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 baseball team. I know Frank very well. Frank coached me in, 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 uh, in baseball. Frank always wanted to be a referee or a coach or something. When I met him, that's what he was doing. And he was over Frank Garrett Park, his San Antonio. So did he move here? Later? Moved from Brenham here and somehow got involved with uh, the park uh, uh, organization with the city. And they put him to work on the west side. And, that, and he took over and, and I think it's named after him. What is your favorite memory of him? Well, Frank was just a good guy. He coached us in football, baseball, tennis. At that time, I was I I I, I was no, I was an athlete, and I really wanted to be, and I thought I was good, except especially on on baseball. But. I never did get a chance to get the training that I needed. I could, basically, you could, you couldn't, you couldn't even hardly, you couldn't go sit, sit, play on the white teams. You couldn't sit in the parks and everything. But so I played. Uh, just, I have a name for it, but I can't tell you. But it's, yeah. Um. So he was able to coach all of those sports? Oh, yes. That's what he did. As a young man, he started out. When I first met him, he was, when we started playing football in the school in 1936. Now, the, the government didn't furnish us equipment for the football team. We had to go around and canvas the merchants and everything to buy. So. That's what they, 36 and eight, we found our first uh, uh, football team. Frank was a coach then. Now at that time, I was 16 years. I never knew how Frank, old Frank was because he was coaching when I was 16 years old. And he married my play mother. Yeah. Your, your play mother? In school, grammar school, they all the uh, seniors students we had play families, and one of the play families was mine was Frank and and his wife. I've never heard that term before. What well, is a play family? Okay, here's a big school. We got maybe three hundred children growing. And this goes from the 11th grade all the way back to the primer. All right. The kids in the fourth grade, and the juniors and the seniors up here, they were pretending to be married in school. It was the father and the mother. And they looked out for the small kids. I have never heard of that either that, before. That was quite true. Frank Garrett, I never will forget, Fannie Mae. She was a black girl, black, but she must have been Indian because she was dog, but she was very pretty and had pretty white teeth. Always, always remember. What was her maiden name? Uh, Johnson, Fannie Mae Johnson, I believe. That's it. I, I've never heard of that, um, that was quite normal back then, yes. As a way of, of helping the younger students? It was a way, I, now understand, but it was not legal. This is something the students did. This didn't go no higher than the students. But the, 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 the Fannie Mae being my play mother, she kind of, if I got my nose need wiping, she wiped my nose, you know, maybe straighten my britches up on me or tell me, Johnny, don't do that. Or if I wanted somebody and I wanted to cry and lean on or something like that. They, yeah. When did you come to San Antonio? 
1939. I think it was in September. What did your father do for a living in Brenham and then in San Antonio? <laughs> My father was a porter in one of the, the large mercantile story, stores in Brenham. And he was very proud of being a porter. And <laughs> what Porter being a janitor, I never could understand. He did he took care of that job just like he was a professional. And he was all over the store. He was over here where they sold groceries, over here where they sold shoes and clothes and everything, anything. Tommy, go do this. Where's the so and so and so? Oh, go take the mail. Go do this. Everything. And in those days, we blacks uh, worked for these rich families, the Holtz, H-O-L-T. Like you got the Holtz here, there might be some. Uh, and we kind of felt kin to those people. And in a way, as much as they were allowed to, they kind of looked out for us a little bit, you know, yeah. What was the name of the uh, department store? There you go. Oh. Uh, the Mercantile. Uh, Holtz Department Store was all I can tell you. It's on Main Street down there. And they sold everything uh, from uh, suits, dresses, uh, shoes, underwear. And then on the, on the other side, they sold. Uh, all groceries and everything, yeah. And what did your mother do? Was she at the My home? mother was a housewife. And she took in washings uh, and mostly in her, in her uh, 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 really skill was ironing shirts, ironing. She she could she could do a, 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 a white shirt up as well as any laundry today, and also us kids going to school, she dressed us up, ironed our clothes and everything. My think my my family my brothers and I were about the best dressed kids in school, and she did it all with iron. Was your father able to bring things home from the mercantile for the family? <laughs> My father really uh, planned the menu for my family. And every night when he would come in, he would bring whatever kind of uh, meat we, we would have. Like you're going to have uh, 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 uh. Yeah, okay. Like we were going to have liver, he'd bring the liver home. We were going to have fish, he would bring the fish home. Uh, 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 whatever we, we were going to eat at night, but I can't remember now. Oh yeah, now honey, uh, they would catch possums, old possums as he would call them, uh, out on the farms, put them in the sack and bring them in to my, give my father. And we would kill that possum and we'd have possum for dinner. Oh, you almost have to dress up. Oh, oh, you cooked that possum with a with an apple in his mouth. Oh. <laughs> we need to take one pause here, just a second. She has a question. Oh, all right. Okay. All right. Um so we 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 ended talking about the possum with the apple in his mouth. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> but I think that we we're gonna move on. Where did you go to school? I went to school at uh, uh, let's see, uh, I went to school at Watersville Elementary School, and I went from the, uh, I don't know, elementary, from the first grade through the third grade there. And I graduated and went on the other side to Brenham High School. Picker, in fact, Picker, 
Pickard High School. And then your your father moved to San Antonio. No, 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 no. Oh. No, 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 no. Oh, okay. My set family stayed in 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 my family died in in in, in Brown. Okay. But this was cross town. Wallaceville is a section of Brown. Just that well that's where I had in walking distance from my house. I went there every day and came back through the third grade. Finished the third grade, I had to go across town to Pickett High elementary, elementary and high school. From the fourth grade through the 11th grade, I went there and I finished the 11th grade in 1939. And so we're getting close to World War II. Close. What, what happened between 39 and 40 whenever you went into the military? Okay, 1939, May, I finished high school. And finished high school, I, and I, while in high school, I met a very pretty girl that was a was my, 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 my girlfriend, courted each other. What was her name? And the night we graduated from school, I asked her to marry me, and she said yes. Didn't have a job. Her father was a rich man, almost. That's another subject. But Tell she- Tell me her name. Clay Lois Whiting. W-H-I-T-I-N-G. I really think that she was probably had a third grade white people, in, in, in other words, mulatto. But anyway, I got engaged, engaged to her. It fell in love, fell in love so much till I stopped the study of school just making love to her. But anyway, uh, I walked around in Brenham for three months and didn't have a job. And I was able to just hitchhike to get go to the country where she lived on a ranch. And it dawned on me that I was never going to get the kind of job to give her the type of life her father was able to give her. What was her father's name? Um, Isaac. Whiting, W-H-I-T-I-N-G. Uh, so, uh, I, I read a newspaper that they needed 40 men in Fort Sam Houston to join the military. And at that time, you could not get into the military unless there was a vacancy. Well, they came up with a vacancy at Fort Sam Houston. And there were two other guys that I know that was in the military. One man was a Spencer, and the other was Frank Gary's brother, Dick. Dick was in the, got into the Navy, Navy somehow. This advertisement in the paper allowed me to uh, make a long story short, go to the recruiter station in Brenham, all the one department thing about big as this room, and the guy, the uh, recruiter, signed me up to go to Houston to be examined and and get into the military. So I put a knapsack on my shoulder, little, little, and with, with change of clothes and everything and hitchhike my way from Burnham to Houston. On the way to, I would hitchhike, and I went as far as Chapel Hill, about 10 miles, and as far as I could go there, and a white man come by and picked me up and took me to Houston. And while on the way to Houston, he asked me where was I going. I told him I was going to Houston, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and he got to talking about he was a soldier in World War I, and he went to France, and they got 
wounded with, with the shrapnels and thing. Still had the scars on him. And it dawned on me, they asked him, I said, well, do you think I'm going to the right, doing thing? He said, yeah, I think you'd be joining the army. Well, that kind of concerned. But anyway, I didn't know nothing about Houston at all. He drove me from Chapel Hill all the way to Houston and to it downtown to right in front of the recruiting office and say, there it is. Right. So, do, do you remember his name? No, ma'am. I did never know his name. I only met him when he picked me up. We talked about the, going, uh, the service and he said, I think you would like it. And I went in and made, well, make a long story short. Uh, I qualified to join the army, and they and, and they sent me to a ticket to come to San Antonio. To that's why I was going to take my basic training, but they didn't trust me with the take ticket. It was a, a, a Spanish guy there, and he was coming to San Antonio too. So he, they gave him the two tickets, and I had to meet him that night at the train station. And he gave me my ticket and I got on the train. He got on in the white car. I was in the car for the blacks. Come to San Antonio to the station on Brownford, I mean on uh, 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 Commerce Street. He got off and there was a big army truck there right down the street. And when I got out, I was like, hey, uh, you Johnny Hubbins, yeah. Come down here. And, and I got on this truck. And I was the last person on the truck, I believe, but some other, I was the only black on there. The rest were white. So they drove down Conway Street, got to New Brownville Street. Now this is, I didn't know what the street's name was then. And I think that was the end of the city limits there. I know, no, maybe, maybe. I, I might have been the end of the city limits. But anyway, turned on New Brownson Street and come all the way into Fort Sam. And when we run, come through Fort Sam and come down New Brownson Street, I saw all these big red buildings and then some tents over here on the side and these round buckets, I don't know what you would call a fun light, was hanging on the side. And I said, well, you know, that's where they water the horses. Oh, what am I into now? And I'm scared of horses. Oh, what did I get myself? Just so I stayed on the truck. They took me to Dodd Field. Now, this is where the cemetery is now, at Dodd Field. And they had a, uh, what you call it now? I don't know, but it's where all new people come in and they had to go for processing and everything. And I'm the only black there. And the rest is all whites and everything. All right. When it get dirty for meal time and everything, they fed us, but I had to eat at the table by myself. But I got all the food. Hey, hey, now I'm not insulting about this because this has been going on in my life all the time. I'll never have it eaten with the white. So, well, long story short, they got ready to send him out to get away and they got that, finally got down to me. Put me on the truck and I'm riding on the back. I can't see where I'm going. And all at once they stopped and went down a little alley. And when they stopped, I was at a house, great big house, but it was one door I could fix it to do it. And I walked in and the first page was Sergeant Todd, T-O-D-D. -D. A big red looking man, had on an army dress suit and leggings, and he was, he was immaculate. He looked at me. Hell's a crew, he said. Recruit is really what they come in and call it, crews. Just coming in. Well, you was always a scapegoat when you was coming in. 
Look at you, here's a crew. Come here, crew. Hey. I'm gonna give you a single number. Write it down. 629-8841. Now don't forget this. I'm gonna call, I'm gonna give you some clothes, but I'm gonna call you and I'm gonna ask you to give this name to me because you're gonna be living with this number for the rest of your life in the military. Okay. So he issued me some sheets, a pillow, and everything. This is a great big building. And over here you can see a whole lot, lot of people in there. Let's say maybe 60, 70 people in there. You should be going to come back and ask me. Hey, crew. Yeah, what did that suit? The same number I gave you. The 629 884. That's it. Long story short. Then I walked into this room. And here's a room about 60 people in it, and they're all black. Ha, 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 ha. Now I'm feeling quite not into this by myself now. So I guess for about a week, we was all just milling around together because the, if these was new people, new people coming in for this 40 people. This went on for about a week, and then they began to they would get us together and send us out on little details. Uh, go over here and move some furniture. Go down here and, uh, I mean, move this over here or do this or that. Okay, whatever it was, but that, that went, and then all at once, they got us together and in walked this man, black man in full dress uniform. He introduced himself. I am William Suba, S-U-B-E-R. I am your first sergeant. From here all, I'm your mother, I'm your father, I'm everything. You remind me, I, and I will, I'm, I'm here to teach you your basic training. Uh, they put it all together and I won't say march, we didn't march, we walked from Pine Street over to where the uh, what I'm talking about, the PX, right in where the PX, where you get your medicine, you know, out there now. That's, we had, they had transported some CC camp, that's another story, buildings from round, round Burnham up there, and they just kind of like church slack, you know. And this was our barracks and said, this is where you live. And we must have had about four of those buildings. I wish I had the picture of them I did have. So we had, and then they did these, these 80 men, or 100 men, they divided us into four groups. And the way they did it, they had us all to line up in one line. And then they started up at the front, and all the tall men was at the front, and then they just graduated all the way down to the last one. The last one was the third platoon. Going backwards, the other one was the second one. The tallest one was the first. Now we had about 40 men in each group. And each one of those groups had leaders. Call them acting sergeants, acting corporals. They weren't getting paid for it. We were all getting $21 a month. But they acting. And we had to, and they was all responsible to well, from the corporals was for the sergeant, the sergeant was uh, uh, to the techs, and on on up. Which group were you in? I was in the second group. I was about five nine, and I was lucky. I I, I landed under. Well, I, I'm not talking myself. The training group came from 
Wachuca up to San Antonio to train us. The sergeant I'm telling you was the top man. Wachuca they sent him, could they call a cadre, in under him to train us. And for three months they gave us infantry training. You started everything from the time you wake up in the morning until you go go to bed and wake up the next morning. We got trained. We got trained to do everything, all the way to talk to the sergeants, talk to the commander and everything, and how to march and uh, how to eat and just how to wear your clothes and how long to wear your clothes and how you got them together to go to the laundry and uh, just uh, just everything. Did you end just, up serving overseas? But Did you end up going overseas? I did, but there's like, that's, I, I, that puts me way before this story. I finished basic training and after basic training, If you know where the, the medical, where you get your medicine, across coast motor pool. Went up to motor pool and said, and said, hey, well, get one of these trucks and they were saying, you gonna drive. I didn't know how to drive. And at that time, every truck you picked up had a different ship. So you get in there and you just had to start one and keep on till you get it to move. And you move it up and everything. It was just playing around with them, you know. So sooner or later, we learned well enough to start hauling, haul, doing uh, uh, jobs on, on Fort Sam, hauling. Here again, we were tr we were in the uh, Company H, forty seven Quartermaster Company. That's what these eighty men were. And we were attached to the second division. Stanley Rule was all, you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Stanley Rule was all second division. The big tall building. They were white. No blacks in there. We were across the street. We were we were blacks in this little company. Okay. So this is this is now. Uh, let me get this. Uh, this is uh, just give, give me a minute. This is okay. come here uh, when I when I arrived here. September, okay. Of thirty nine. Se September nineteen thirty nine. Okay, for about three months we were trading. Then they started us off. Then they issued us. Brand new GMC two and a half ton trucks. And it's about 80 men, and we got about 60 trucks. All in rows and everything that was issued. Well, now we had learned to drive by starting out over these trucks. We had learned to drive. So, 47 H Company. We did hauling jobs around on the base. Uh, they had a place down here by Pleasanton where they used to play war. We have to haul the troops down there and pretend to be hauling them and we got captured by the enemy and everything. Well, we, we did all of that. <clears throat> this went on until the war broke out. In, in December the 1st, 1941. Uh, uh, the, the draft started September. Now, between September and December, uh, they start, had put up camps, drafting people putting them in these camps all around, down around Giddens and up in Austin and Dallas and Oklahoma and all that. And then we people that had been in the service uh, 
or uh, maybe a year, a year and a half, had basic training. They started getting what they called cadres. They would select 10 men out of that group and send them to Oklahoma to start another company. And the 10 men again to go down here to uh, uh, maybe, what, what, I don't know, uh, Compass, and somewhere to go over here to El Paso. So I, I was a high school graduate. And I was one of the few high school graduates in the company. I don't know whether my first sergeant could read or write. He was a hell of a soldier. Now he knew everything in the world about soldiering, and even the post commander, he probably knew him when he was second, when he was second. Now that's how I'm a, Is that Todd? Huh? What was his name again? Suba. Suba. William okay. Suba. Oh, what a soldier. Oh, what a soldier. Look, the way they, you see these campaign hats that the uh, highway patrolmen wear, called campaign hats. These guys bought these hats, they paid $20 for them back then. And that cap, and it didn't have a wrinkle in it nowhere. They wore tailor-made shirts with three creases in the back. It, his belt was bleached white, shined, but, oh, oh. They, 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 and they were soldiers. They was just, now these guys were maybe not, these guys were maybe not educated, but they were professional soldiers. They came out of the, now these, this bunch, came out of the 25th Infantry, and we had, the, that was down in Arizona. They had the 9th and 10th Cavalry up in uh, Fort Riley, Kansas, and everything, but they were professionals, so. What happened with the, your girlfriend, your, that you felt? Coming to that. Uh, I got, got in the cadre, We'll skip something. And I go to Wyoming training the, 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 the uh, new people, the draftees. Do that for three months. I did my group so well till they selected me to be the first sergeant of this group that was going down here to, uh, in Texas here, I won't, I won't call the name in it. And I did, and I, I presided over those 80 men for a couple of years overseas. That got shipped overseas, went to Australia, and from Australia into Pawpaw, New Guinea. And I stayed in Pawpaw until 1944. And then that's when they started to, to rotate soldiers back to the state. And I was lucky enough to get selected to come back to foot. So I come back here in May of 1944. I had been overseas over two years then. Did and you see fighting while you were in the islands and Paul? I was in I was in the um, war a battle of the of, 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 of Coral Sea. I was in that now. My, my company's job in the quartermaster, we, we were transported food and goods to the front. Now whatever happened between the front and back there where we were, we was in the fight. See, I'm in a truck driving all right, but my gun's sitting right there beside it. And when the fight started, I'm in the fighting too. So that's the way it was. We supplied MacArthur's army. I was under General MacArthur uh, twice. He was a very, very fine general. Yes, ma'am. See, in the uh, uh, transportation, the army marches on its stomach. You up here fighting in front, now you got to eat. Who's going to feed you? We got to take the food to them. Well, if they fighting up there, we are in the fight. Now we can, when we get through, we can drive out of the fight. 
See? That's, that's the reason why I lost my ear. From a blast? Blast. Blast. So you came back in 44? 1944. May of 44. And what happened then? <coughs> well, <laughs> um, I had a 30-day furlough when I came back. Visit my parents and everything in Brenham. Uh, well, I, let me go back. I, when I made me first sergeant, I, I married this girl and took her with me and for three months. And then I had to go overseas and she went back home. And while she was there and stayed so long, she went out to California and got into civil service. When I came back to the States, instead of finding her at home, I found her. She, so I sent for her and she come back and joined me. And we celebrated my follow and everything. I mean, my, back, back there. And then uh, they had a replacement depot here in San Antonio, soldiers all in there. And they were sending you here and sending you out there. And they decided to send me back to Wyoming. So she had gotten a job here at Kelly Field. And I went to Wyoming by myself and she stayed here at Kelly Field. And this, this went on until I got her. But she, she would come and spend maybe a year or two with me wherever I was and everything and they'd send me someplace. The only reason I got out is because of I come to San Antonio and I was on military police control here in San Antonio for maybe a couple of years. You were military police? Yes. You said that's what you worked? That's, that's what I, I first was transportation corps. And when I re-enlisted, uh, this is a long story. I found out that uh, the I, I I was looking for a job as a as a master sergeant. Now, I'm a master sergeant, and I don't have no job. They pay me every month religiously, but I don't have no job. This is about segregation now. President Roosevelt did not know the army was segregated. He discovered that the, the, that the first sergeant in this company over here and me and first sergeant over here, I couldn't be in that company because it was white. But I think I was getting the same pay this guy was. President Roosevelt said, well, this is a taxpayer's expense, so I'm going to change this. I'm going to integrate this army. Gave that order, but he died before it was taking place, President Truman came in and decided to do exactly what he did do. So they did in, in, integrate the armies. All right, now, we have got to learn to black soldiers being over white soldiers. We, we had to learn to do that. That was very hard, but we did learn it. We didn't have no other choice like it is today. We didn't have no other choice. You had to learn. If that you had them six stripes on your arm, that was six stripes on your arm, whatever it was. Black, white, blue, green, or gray. We learned to live with that. And what it is today, it's a beautiful thing. But the problem about segregated armies was it was not about getting shot at. Getting shot at was just as black as it was, and you had to shoot back. But it was social. We couldn't dance together. We couldn't marry each other. You know. Now that was the law of the land. And the military uh, did respect that. They did that. When we got, you go on the base, you go to the movie. The white folks had to sit over here and you sit back here. 
that went on, and I guess that, and I, I, I guess I hate to admit that, but that worked. But getting shot at sooner or later, you get tired of sitting back there and somebody else sitting over there. That's what it's all about. We're running short of time for today. Ma'am? We're running short of time for today. Yeah. I hate it because I think we're just getting started. They asked me to ask you if, if you know anything about the Hay Street Bridge. Any, any history of that? Uh, any yes, ma'am. Tell me what you know about that. Uh, I had a girlfriend that lived on Hay Street out across New Brownfield Street. And if you go up Hayes Street and cross that bridge, you was in town in San Antonio crossing the railroad track. And I think it's the S SP Railroad, I believe it is. The bridge goes under there. Now it was rickety back in those days and you'd be drive across it, it'd be this slow, but it wasn't never enough. But I know about that. And uh <laughs> I know it belongs to, I guess, the city and the state of San Antonio. I don't know no other. I don't know no other thing, thing about it. Was there anything that occurred in that community that you remember? The neighborhood that was around Hay Street Bridge. Uh, anything that comes to mind? Stories that things that happened in that area. No, ma'am. I don't. <laughs> uh, being a military policeman, my, this was my area down in there, A Street. Oh, yes. I was on, on the black side of the town. I was over the military. Now, my jurisdiction was over all military. It's okay. Oh, oh my God! Oh no, it's not Quit. broken. It's just oh, it just came off. My okay. jurisdiction, I was over all, but the area that I police was on the on, on the east side. So I know everything that I don't say no, but I'm aware of things going on. Did uh, did some of the military folks live in Hay Street in that area? Yes, ma'am. We had you rent rooms in there. Yes, all Hay Street. Uh, I can call, can't call all those names down there now. Uh, Walters. Somebody was looking for something down there. They, they, yes, we told them to see. I'm going to pause just for a second. Okay. So, um, as a military police, what, what did you have to do to patrol? What, what was your role? Uh, well, we just, my headquarters was my, now, we have a provo marshal that's over all the military police in in San Antonio. They have one, not, not, not on the base now, and his office is downtown in the headquarters of the police chief, mayor on, on, I like to call her name now. St. Mary's. Our job is to patrol all this area down here and take care of the soldiers. Any soldiers is doing wrong, we apprehend them. If he's getting in trouble, we apprehend him anyway and take him back to the military. We are there to look out for the soldiers. The soldiers of that day, it was altogether different now for the soldiers then and the soldiers now. Education. Now we just got, he gonna get drunk for, no, if we get him, we gonna take him back to the base before he get in trouble. See, if he's in this place over here where we know they gambling drug, we're going to tell him get out of here and we're going to have that place put off limits. We were there really for the soldiers. Well, now, I, I, I got that job under a man called Sergeant Smith. 
Now, the guys that like Sergeant Smith, he had about 20 some odd years service. And off the record, they call them town tamers. Town tamers. Now, they go in and they keep the soldiers out of trouble in this town. They keep the people off the soldier. They're going to get the soldier out of it. We cleared it up to soldiers had a bad name once upon a time. And in that time, they were not educated. Some of them was drunks, just anything. But they were good soldiers. Now they, hey, they would shoot. Don't let him, don't let him shoot at you now, cause he's gonna hit you. So, but now as I'm saying that, we cleaned up the 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 the, the uh, what I'm trying to say, the the, the 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 kind of people that was in it. We cleaned it, cleaned it up. What years were you uh, uh, doing the patrol? Uh. Around 1948, from then on until I retired, I was a military policeman. I retired as a police prisoner. When did you retire? Uh, one February, 1960. And did you do anything after that time? I, uh, civil service, I, 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 I bought and sold real estate and I managed the uh, 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 automobile repair center. Which one? The automobile repair center, which which one did you manage? Uh, it was on Houston Street. It was East Side Motor Service, I think. I think it was, yeah. Now tell me if you have any special memory of Hay Street Bridge, anything that happened there. No, ma'am. I don't know of anything that happened there. I, I don't understand today what happened there. Is there anything in that community in, that you were patrolling, any special memory that stands out of something that occurred that you took care of as a patrol? I can't think of one thing that happened on, all I know about the Hay State, the whole it was a rickety bridge going across certain streets and going over the railroad track to get into town. And, and that, and cause that Southern Pacific, Sometimes it had so many cars, it would block block the entrance going into San Antonio. That's all I know about the And was this a main uh, a route for people to cross over using that bridge? Did you was that a main? Well, you had many places now, like Nolan Street. Nolan Street goes down and comes up under the bridge. Commerce Street goes over the bridge. Uh, what other street can I tell you? Uh, uh, let me see now. Going in, all, all. See the railroad track runs runs what across that, that is that north and south, and the streets goes east and west. Any time you going from the east side to the, you got to cross that cross the bridge. Well, now on New Brownfields, the track is down low. On East Hay Street, it's up high. Now, that's the only reason why the bridge is there is to get across that. Now, as I understand it, some, this was private property. The Hay Street Bridge covered pri private property. And the, ra and, and the roads went under there. Now, that's all I know about the Hay Street. But I don't, I don't know of any, I was looking for it to fall down. It was, it must have been very rickety at that It time. was rickety, yes ma'am. It, it was. was wooden? Ma'am? It was a wood bridge? Was it made out of no, wood? No ma'am, I think it was made out of metal because I can remember hearing the noise going over there. Yes ma'am. 
and the community lived on, on each side? The black community was on both sides? Uh, down in there, you did have, yes, ma'am, of course, I remember passing well, well, oh, very good friend of mine lived right, right, right here at Cherry Street. Right in. Yes, ma'am. Yes, when we turned off the street, we come in on there, uh, right there on Nolan, I believe. Right, right there on Nolan Street, it, a very pretty girl that lived there was a graduated from high school with me back in there. So it was, yes, we had blacks living in here. It was also a lot of Spanish living in here. Down in this area, you could find prostitutes. I think Second Baptist Church was over on Chestnut Street. Yes, ma'am. And did you say that you knew the Sutton family? That I knew family? about them. I didn't know them personally. But in San Antonio, you had, you had to know the Suttons and you had to know the Bellingers. Even though you never saw them, that was the hierarchy in San Antonio. And what did you hear about them, the Suttons? Nothing bad. I think one time, I don't know, I kind of halfway remember Miss Sutton and a Cadillac. And they were known to own property, a uh, 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 old man Sutton and and Bellinger was a millionaire. He owned everything. I stood, I read about him since 1936 in the in the in the in the newspapers, the black newspapers. Mm -hmm. I hate to call us halt call a halt today because okay. we haven't covered half of everything. Well, but. I'm I, I am available at all times. You got my telephone number. I'd be too happy, even if you want to come to my home in Lakeside in San Antonio, I'd be glad to have you. In fact, I want you to to to, to notify me and I'll have a little uh, deal for you, whatever you would call it. Get, get. I'm, I'm from North Carolina, so I'm heading back there tomorrow. Oh. But, they will, they probably are going to want to follow up on your interview. I would love, just love, because I, I have a whole lot of things on my mind about the, 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 the Black experience. I, I, I think that there's a lot more for you to tell us. Yes, so we'll, we'll ask them to follow up with you, okay? Yes, ma'am. Oh, right. Thank you so much. And for thank today. you so much, because oh, I, I've been wanting to do this for a long time. Oh. Do what? Is it A or eight? Eight. Uh